Good morning and welcome to Urban Voice Gordon's Bay. I trust that you had a really great Easter celebration. It was wonderful to be able to again with Christians all around the world celebrate everything that Jesus has done for us on the cross and then to celebrate Resurrection Sunday and the transformation that comes into our lives because of Christ. Uh, we had the opportunity to go to the Northern Cape, three kilometers from the border of Namibia to a wedding. And it was a wonderful celebration there as well. And thank God we uh, drove back safely. We didn't have any issues along the road. And it's so good to be able to share God's word with you again this morning. But there's one important announcement I'd like to make. There are those of you that have been watching online. And we've been speaking over a number of weeks about starting an online congregation or trying to connect with you in a way um, that is more than just you watching um, the sermon on a Sunday. So next Sunday, we'll be connecting on Zoom with those who are interested in being part of that congregation. And we're going to have a time of coffee and then also being able to open up God's word in that kind of context. This morning... We're gathering at one place uh, here in Gordons Bay. Uh, for many of those who are able to meet in person, we are gathering at the Angling Club and having a time of celebration. I hope that the songs that you've been singing this morning has again warmed your heart. I'm still singing songs of Resurrection Sunday and just celebrating that. Let's pray as we get into God's Word. Thank you, Lord, again for your hand in our lives. Thank you, Lord, even as we're still reflecting on Easter Sunday, we realize that it's not just one day a year, but every day of our lives that we can celebrate the resurrection. But more than that, we celebrate that you came so that we can have life abundantly, that we can walk out of the tomb and walk into a new life. And so we ask that even as you speak to us through your word today, Holy Spirit, we welcome you and we ask you to teach us and change us. We cannot change ourselves. We need you to change and transform us. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're continuing with our series called Centered. It's about making Christ the center of your life. It's about not living life in segments. And uh, as we have come to this passage today, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, it's all about observation. And in chapter 3 onwards, it's about application. How do we live this life in the 21st century? So the focus is on application. And I want to remind you of a verse that I used in the last sermon. Um, and it's in verse 17 of chapter 3, it says this. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever you do, Paul is talking about whole life living. And that's the nature of Christianity. Jesus comes into your life, you surrender your life to him, you accept him as your Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit works inside of you to transform every part of your life. And how does he do that? By making him central. Someone said, you know, you, people can be so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good. Well, here Paul is telling us we have to live the Christian life in this world. We need to display and show forth what Christ has done and how our lives have been changed. And we are walking testimonies of God's saving grace. And so how do we live as Christians in the 21st century? How do we live a Christ-centered life right now here on earth? Through the humdrum of everyday life and also with others. And today we want to focus on how do we live that life in the home? In the home. We're thinking about family. And some of you, uh, we've grown up in different family environments. Some of us uh, have great memories of our family. Some of us have memories of our family that is not so great. But as we look at family, we need to ask ourselves, how do we live as a family within a family? So we as Christians, as a family, how do we live within the family of God? 
Now, if you go to the Bible, we see some devastating effects of sin on the family. Let's just go right to the beginning. Adam and Eve sinned. What did Adam do? He blamed his wife. Then they had two sons initially. There were more that was born. But these two sons, Cain, killed his brother Abel. Well, then later on we hear this great guy, Abram, that was chosen by God and called by God. You know, he, he couldn't have children. Well, God had promised him children, but it was taking a bit of, bit of a, you know, a long time. So he got himself a second wife. And then he had a child with her. And then he kicked this woman out, Hagar, with her son out of the family, out of the house. Well, we go further on, there's Jacob, who had several wives. He also had 12 sons, and he fa his one son was the favorite, and he gave him this amazing technicolor dream coat, this coat of many colors. And the other brothers got jealous, and they put him in a pit and sold him into slavery. And we go further, David had many wives, and then he even had, uh, he looked and took another man's wife, Bathsheba. And, and then he had children, and one of his sons uh, raped his sister, and, and the other son, Absalom, then killed the brother that raped the sister. Wow! We can see from the biblical narrative the effects that sin has had on family relationships. And when Jesus died on the cross, and he came to bring new life, he also came to restore God's purpose and plan for the family. And we see in the Bible how family has been broken by sin. We see that in our world. Some of us have experienced it. My own family, my parents got divorced on my 17th birthday. What a birthday present. And I looked at that and for myself, I said, I want to make sure that my marriage lasts and that it honors God. I don't want to be the husband my dad was and I don't you know, want to raise my children in exactly the same way. I want to look at what the Bible teaches us and see how can I do better. And so Paul writes now to the family. And so today's sermon is about making Christ the center of your family life. Christ must be central to our family life. I just want to remind those who are not married, you know, those who intend to get married, you need to listen to the sermon. Those who um, are not married any longer, um, you may need to hear this so that you could help others who are married. It's important for us to know that we're part of one family. That as single people, we need to be praying for married people. And as married people, we need to be considering and praying for single people. It's for those who have no children. It's also for those whose children have left home. And this is for all of us. Don't check out now. I want you to listen. And if you're thinking about getting married, those of you who are watching today, uh, this is going to be a sermon that's going to help you. So Paul offers guidance to prepare ourselves and to help us in our marriages and in our family life. But it also helps us to guide others who may need Christian input into their family life. Let's go to Colossians Chapter 3, verse 18 to 21. Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and never treat them harshly. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. There are four verses that deals with husbands, Wives, children, and then fathers. One verse allocated for each family member. And as we listen to this, I want us to ask the question, what is God's original design for the family? That family that wasn't influenced by sin yet. Only in the first three chapters, we see families. First three, first three chapters of the Bible in Genesis do we see the world without sin? And Christ came so that he can restore the family. So let's have a look at that. I need to un help you to understand the culture of the time and actually how that culture may even still influence our world today. In those times, the time that Paul is writing to these men in Colossae, these 
Husbands, they ruled the house. They were the rulers. They kind of owned their wives as well as their children. Women and children had no legal rights. Uh, an example, a man would live in a two-story um, house or the family would live in a two-story home. The dad would have the upstairs floor. The mother and the children would be at the bottom. He had his own man cave at the top and they weren't allowed even to come up there. And it, you know, women even whatever happened in the marriage, they had no legal right. So the husband could actually do just as he pleased. No one told the men that they needed to live in this particular way. They saw what their dads did and they perpetuated that. And so the first person that Paul writes to his wives, and he says, wives submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the, to the Lord. Now, the word submit, as soon as you hear it, soon as the ladies, the women are hearing that word, they are thinking all sorts of um, evil things. Evil things in the way that things that have been done to them and how uh, this word is so problematic about submission. When you fight in a wrestling match, the men will understand that and we've seen that, you submit by tapping out to say, no, I, I, I give up, I lose, I, I, I submit to you. But Paul is not suggesting um, that kind of submission that has been even perpetuated by Christianity. Where Christian men have told their wives and quoted scripture just as Paul wrote and says, I am the head of the home, you must do what I say. Women are not called to obey their husbands, they are called to submit to their husbands. There's a big difference between the two. And so this whole word of submission, it would get you to think of downtrodden women about mis misogynistic husbands, um, about women who can't think for themselves or, or, or have someone else making the decisions all on their behalf. They can't contribute to the decision-making processes in marriages and they're told to keep quiet and not get involved. And the men rule. That's not what Paul's saying. And so he writes to these women and this verse, for them, the women at the time who are listening, it wouldn't raise many eyebrows because that was their lot in life. This is what they experienced. They had understood, hey, I must submit to my husband. But Paul was trying to say something by adding this part. As is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. He's writing to Christians and he's saying, as those who belong to the Lord, there's a different way in which you will submit to your husband now. It's not the same way as what the culture of the day says it should be. Paul is writing to Christian wives and there's an assumption that they have Christian husbands. And these husbands are submitted to the Lord. And so Paul is saying in your way that you live your life with your husband, um, Eve was there to be Adam's helpmate. Adam needed a helper. Men need a helper. We hate to admit it, but we do. Wives are there to help husbands, to support them, to, to bring added value into their lives. And this marriage relationship is one where there's a mutual respect for one another. Men need help. I just want to say, guys, in some areas of your life, your wife is more competent than you. And all the wives are smiling right now and giving a nudge. My wife, Donalda, does numbers. She knows physical science. She understands the garden. Uh, she's got green fingers. I do words. I do words. There's areas that she's way more competent than I am. Here's a good question to ask when you, if you have children. To what do your children come to you for mothers? What questions do they ask you? What advice do they come to you for? And what advice do they go to their fathers for? That will tell you, dads, 
<laughs> just where the competency lies because they will recognize it. And so women are also there, be, uh, are also much more emotionally, they're more intelligent than men. And they have more words, definitely. They have more words. You, your wife has got independent thoughts and she will tell you, even if you don't ask. I've been on the receiving end of that. And that's great. If, if that doesn't happen, then there's a problem in your marriage. But men are not complex. You ask them a question and they won't find the words to describe how they're feeling emotionally. And so the women, the wives help them. Honey, you seem to be frustrated. And the guy's thinking, mm, that's the word I've been looking for. Yes. You see, men also can't deal with this being vulnerable because the world has conditioned men to be a kind of cowboys don't cry culture. This indoctrination that has happened to them. And so wives are there to support the husbands, to help them to make good decisions. My wife is an analyst. And I'm a risk taker. And when you put the analyst and the risk taker together, they can do some amazing things. But wives, you're there to support them in ways that honor Jesus. You see, this submission is not forced. It's giving support to your husband. It's helping your husband. But it's based on his love for you. Let's look at what Paul writes to husbands. Husbands, love your wives. You see, at this point, the Colossian male readers actually wanted to get up and walk out of the church. No way. They must work for me. They must serve me. That was the thought patterns. And Paul is saying, as Christians, we are to love our wives, which is totally different to what the culture taught. Love our lives. Men needed to make a big change. And we said, and I said earlier, love is based on a mutual respect. Christian love is unconditional love. It is an action that seeks out the best for the other person. It's not selfish. And Jesus showed us what that looked like. We've just commemorated Easter. It showed how he selflessly gave of himself for our benefit died on the cross so that we might be forgiven so that we might be set free he paid the penalty for our sin and as husbands we are to love our wives in that way actually all christians are to love others in that way not selfishly and so guys husbands how do you love your wife does she feel loved does she think my husband has the, my best interest at heart? Is it reciprocal? The way that you love her, she has no problem in loving you back, in supporting you, in submitting and helping you. And so we are to love them and they will respond to our love. Now, Paul gives principles here. He doesn't tell you how to love. You see, there was a book written called The Love Languages. I think it's Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And it describes the different love languages that people have. And some people have two of it and a mixture. But, but actually, guys, it's your responsibility to find out how to love your wife. There's this great song that says, find 100 ways. Compliment what she does. Give her roses just because. If it's diamonds, she, okay, just hold on with the diamonds. So it's important that we need to learn how to love. Ask her. Ask her, how can I love you? And you will quickly discover the things that she enjoys. And when you do that for her and serve her in that way, you display your love for her. And then it goes on further. It says... And never treat them harshly. Husbands, love your wives 
and never treat them harshly. That was a trend of the day and in our world is still a trend today. And you know why? Men are harsh because they're selfish. And when we're selfish, we want our way and we want things to happen and we're not considerate towards the other per people, person. It says in, in, in other versions, be considerate to them. Consider your wives in everything. I remember when my wife had her first accident, she reversed into a pole um, and she came home and told me. Um, and my first response to her was, are you okay? Um, she didn't need me to be harsh. And I could have become a little more harsh when I discovered that she wasn't even sure which road and which pole she knocked into. As we went to try and find out what pole did you knock into. She didn't even get out to check the car to see what was wrong. Now, I could have been harsh, but she had an accident. And my attitude had to be my concern for her. Are you okay, my love? And then I went to have a look at the car. You see, the car can be fixed. But my wife, if anything happened to her, she can't be fixed. So, we need to watch that we don't become harsh. We're not called to be controlling or critical. And sometimes we can do that. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes I don't say thank you enough. Sometimes I, I take her for granted. It's not enough appreciation. There's no bossy tyrant husbands in God's family. And maybe you grew up in a Christian family and your dad was like that. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but he wasn't being godly. And so here the question is, husbands, how you, are you treating God's daughters? Do you take them for granted? Do you act entitled? You see, we are there to protect them. I want my wife to love me, not to fear me. And here's some other good advice. The Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 16, the second part says, This is my beloved and this is my friend. Guys, you need to learn to be best friends with your wife. Your wife needs to be your best friend. Can I say it reverse as well? Wife, your husband needs to be your best friend. This is a good friend zone. You know when people are friend zoned? just want to be friends. Yes, husband and wives need to be friends. Want to be together, do things together. We're starting to love cooking together. You know, it's those moments when we laugh together. I don't want to travel on my own anymore because whenever I go somewhere and she's not with me, I want to tell her, I want her to experience it with me because she's my friend. Are you devoted to your friendship with your spouse? You know, we marry those who are very different to us. Just look at your partner right now. They are the opposite. Opposites attract. And it takes a while to, to work together and to, to work things out because you do things quite differently and maybe sometimes you think quite differently. But when you start to work it out, then it's actually brilliant because you complement one another. And you are better together you better together and then he moves on to children so he spoke to the husband wives spoke to the husbands and then he goes to the children and says children always obey your parents for this pleases the lord so when we look at our world today it is marked by a lack of respect for authority Students don't respect their teachers. Children don't respect and obey their parents. The word obey here says, do as you told. I used to watch a television program many years ago, and uh, the parents, the dad worked for a company called the We Say So Company. And parents have to have this united We Say So. This is what we want you to do. In those days, um, the parents 
Uh, obviously, we tell the children what to do. And Paul is just reinforcing why they need to do it, not out of fear, but because it pleases the Lord. We live in a time where parents are more scared of their children than they are of the Lord. You know, um, they, they wanted to do this or they want to go there and they prefer going to that church and they prefer doing that. And everything is based on what they prefer. And parents sometimes um, how obeying their children rather than their children obeying them. And they say things like, I don't want to break my relationship with the children. By saying no to your child, actually, it also helps them. Because then they grow up in a world where people are going to tell them no. You're not helping them. And they're going to be manipulating you. Can I say, you don't want your children to like you. You want your children to love you. And love is far greater than liking. Because disciplining is out of love. And so, as I said, they, if they are disobedient to their parents, they will disobey every other authority. They will disobey their teachers, their boss, the law. They will even disobey God, who is the ultimate authority. If they can't obey their parents, how are they going to obey God the Father? And so, parents, you have been given a responsibility to raise your child in the ways of the Lord. To admonish them, they need to obey you, and you need to guide them so that their lives do not end up in destruction. And we're going to be held accountable. Why? Because children who obey their parents delight the Lord, but it also delights you. Isn't it amazing when your child is obedient and doing as they're told and actually they're flourishing? It makes a parent's heart glad. And if you're a child today, you want to make your parents' hearts glad. Not sad. If a person never learns obedience at home, they will struggle with disobedience for the rest of their lives. And in Christian homes, oh children, obey your parents because it pleases God. And we want to live our lives to please God. And then he goes back and he speaks to fathers again. Now I know that he doesn't speak to mothers here. He goes back to fathers. I think the context of the time was that fathers were problematic. Today, I want to say respectfully that I still think fathers are problematic. And that we give off a lot of uh, responsibility and things that we should be doing and we just... Hope that the wife will just do what they need to do. The mothers will do what they need to do. As fathers, we can also be nurturing. But here's some specific things. He says, fathers, do not aggravate your children. My daughter loves this verse. And she likes the older version. She says, do not exasperate your children. And why? Because they will become discouraged. Don't provoke them. Don't irritate them. Yes, we do tease them, but... But we mustn't be overbearing and have unreasonable demands on our children. We need to train them, but they are not your little servants. You want to build a relationship with them. Some, some fathers try to live out their dreams in their sons. I can see it sometimes on the rugby field. They didn't play that well. And so, Fricky, you've got to do much better. And, and everything's got to be done so that Fricky needs to live out his father's dream to play first team in whatever sport that his father was not able to play. Or what about favoritism? I mentioned earlier about Jacob and Joseph and, and, and what happened there and how his brothers got angry because of this favoritism causes the children to become exasperated or aggravated. What about fathers who humiliate their children? It is not a good thing to humiliate them. Ah, you won't amount to much. It doesn't help them. Why? Because they will become discouraged, it says. They will lose heart. It leads to a low self-esteem. They will feel worthless, demotivated. It breaks their spirit. And you know what it does? It sows anger. It sows hatred in their hearts. And that 
may be directed towards their own children in the future. And so fathers, we need to set the example. Don't let our actions cause our children to think, ah, oh, when I'm angry, it's okay to swear and to curse. And it's okay to hit someone. And it's okay to lose my temper. We need to be the example to them. And we encourage them by showing them affection. That arm around the shoulder, the hug. That's words of affirmation. And you know what? In the end, it will help them to pray, Our Father. And see God as a loving Father. Many people struggle to pray that prayer. Because their Father has not been loving. And has aggravated them and has caused them to be angry. And so in conclusion, Paul speaks to all of us about our rights and our responsibilities as being part of a biological family. Because it is a reflection of God's family. God desires to see loving, safe homes where husbands and wives mutually respect one another, where there's an a, a atmosphere of love and serving and humility, and where children can be brought up in a loving relationship. Here's my question to you. Are you contributing to that? If you're a mother, father, husband, wife, a child, are you contributing to that? Are you making Christ the center of your marriage? Or are you the center of your marriage? Are you making uh, Christ the center of your family? Or is your children the center of your family? You see, we ought to put our faith and our trust in Him to give Him full control of our lives and then full control of our marriage, full control of our parenting, full control of our children. And here it says about those who belong to the Lord. That's the difference. That's the difference that Paul is saying to this church and to the husbands and wives and the families. He's saying, we are not like the world. We are to be loving like Christ is loving. We need to reflect that. And so as families, I want to encourage us to do that. Jesus Christ is also the one who restores lives and restores relationships. And maybe this morning your marriage is going through some challenges. I want to say, why don't you pray together first of all? Surrender yourselves afresh to God. Then contact me or contact someone who's going to be able to give you some counseling and some guidance. It's always good to speak to someone and to ask people for help. It may not be the end of your marriage. It may just be something that you need some guidance and help through. And can I say, men, don't be like, oh, you know, we don't need to go and see a counsellor. You know, if your wife is asking to do that, it shows that there's some need and you're not going to be the one that's only to blame. Just, just relax about that. It takes two to make a marriage. So Christ is the one who can restore your marriage. Christ is the one that can restore your family as well. Maybe you're parenting and you're struggling with raising your children. Hand them over to God. Surrender your parenting to Him and say, Lord, we need your help in this time. And can I ask you, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, it's not going to work unless He's the center of your life. Won't you do that today? Won't you make him the center of your life? Let's pray together. Father, I want to ask that you would help every person listening, whether they're married or not, to see the importance of you being in the center of their lives. Father, we've all had different experiences growing up in our families. But today, Lord, we want to make sure that as we go forward, that our families are centered in you. Our parenting is centered in you. Our love Marriage relationships are centered in you. I pray for those who may be struggling watching this morning. I pray, God, that may, may they sense your, your love for them and that also you the one that can come and bring restoration and help them through this difficult time, the difficult challenges they may be facing. And so we want to ask you to come and bless each family that's represented today. 
not only in this one place, but wherever we are all around the world, we've asked that you would come and that families again today will have that joy of knowing Christ be central and we're building our families on him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, if God has spoken to you, especially maybe this is an area of your marriage and you're needing some help there, please send me an email, wesley at urbanvoice.org.za. I'd love to guide you, maybe give you some resources and maybe even just have a chat and see how we can help you to grow in that area of your, of your life. Next Sunday, um, we're going to have that Zoom session um, online with uh, those of you who are desiring to be part of the online congregation. Um, the sermon will come out as normal. Um, but also, uh, we'll be doing a sermon next week on Christ being central to our work. Because he now Paul now starts to move from the family and he starts to talk about slaves or workers and slave owners, which means employers, employee relationships. And how do we, we make Christ central in the work that we do? Have a fantastic Sunday further and may God bless you.